So we're going to conclude this afternoon in Washington, D.C. Uh, with a project that looks at sound, looks at really um, how sound could be used as a design opportunity. Uh, and uh, Josh Killian is the author of this project. Uh, his thesis consisted of Michael Ambrose, the chair, uh, Michelle Lamprakis, and myself. It's all yours. Great, thank you. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, we as students don't usually get this opportunity to present our ideas in front of such a crowd, so thank you. Um, and I want to thank my friends and family for not only helping me, but also putting up with me when I've been neglecting them because of this. Um, and of course my committee. If somebody told me three years ago that Professor Ambrose and I would choose each other to work together, I probably would have laughed at them. Um, but it's been great, it's been great. Lots of positive reinforcement. Anyway, um, so in front of you, uh, I will be presenting a eight through eight school, but I want to preface this by saying that uh, my thesis is more of a way of thinking, uh, more of a shift in our attention from our ocular-centric culture to um, noticing more of our oral um, sensibilities and really the implications of those. Um, so firstly, I want to start um, with this image. Uh, I attended this event uh, a few months ago, and um, it was a music event in the Peabody Library. And Several of you are probably familiar with it. Um, but I took this photo, I posted it on Instagram, and I realized that I posted a photo of a music event, and I didn't even think to really record the sound and share that in some way. So it had me thinking, um, and then I immediately realized that the sound quality for music in this little venue is horrible. The HVAC system is incredibly loud. The space was entirely too big, and a lot of parallel surface did not really um, support a music event. But they still host music events in this space. Why? Um, because we tolerate poor sound quality, and we prioritize our visual senses. So regardless of the sound, we still have events in here for music. Um, which leads me to another music venue, um, the Sydney Opera House, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Very iconic, visually. Um, what you may not know, though, is that it's currently going through, or about to go through, a $200 million um, acoustic renovation. And just note that the original budget for this entire building was $100 million, half that. Granted, that was 40 years ago. But it took 40 years for them to finally put their foot down and say, hey, this is not very good sound quality. Um, what it came down to is that the, uh, the venue was entirely too big for the sound. Um, which leads me to one other um, point, um, the ancient Greek amphitheater. So I know personally, whenever I hear the word amphitheater, for some reason I think of sound. But ironically, amphi is a Greek word meaning around. And thea theatron is a um, Greek word meaning to see or to watch. So it has nothing to do with sound, but it turns out that this is a pretty good venue for sound, and it just came out of a happy little accident. Um, because of the politics, the geology, and the climate, they were able to have um, these large gatherings, and the stone and the temperate climate allowed it to be outside, and it turns out uh, we have a really good venue for music or, well, for theater. And the point I want to make here is that until modern technology, everything we knew about acoustics were mainly from accidents. Um, so the thing about acoustics is that you have a building, you experience it, and then you react to it. Um, of course, Vitruvius, who we all know and love, commented on the uh, acoustics of an amphitheater, some of which was spot on, especially for the time, other, um, not so much. But anyway, so it had me thinking about sound, and I realized that you know, I shouldn't just look at music, but I should think of sound in general, so I stepped back, and I 
I basically um, considered, for the sake of this thesis, any desirable music or any desirable sound would be considered music, and then anything unwanted would be considered noise. Just so for here on out, um, that would be the, um, the verbiage that I'll be using. So I'll talk about the benefits of music. Um, it ended up falling into three categories upon my research. So there's um, health benefits, educational benefits, and um, community, um, social benefits. So I'll just briefly talk about a few of these because I'm sure um, several of you are, are familiar with some of them, but some of them are very interesting. So motor task competency, for example. Um, actually, since performing music requires such nuance, such specific repetitive muscle movements, it actually builds the neuron connectivity in your brain and improves your motor task competency. So it's um, even on a neurological level beneficial. Um, communication, of course, um, relationships and increases. These are hormones that involve a relationship. So performing um, synchronous acts, whether it's dancing or um, actually in a band or a marching band, this actually increases these levels of these um, hormones. So it can actually help you relate to other people. And then of course education, there's tons of um, benefits here, um, down to improved memory, they did a study on dementia. Um, but on the other hand, there's issues of noise that we should be aware of as well. Um, and I ended up categorizing these in the same three um, categories. We have health, you know, of course the obvious hearing impairment, um, it causes anxiety, depression, um, community, again, you know, there's the obvious ones like noise interference, um, misunderstandings. Um, so take, for example, a, uh, an urban, maybe you're in an urban row house and you're watching TV and you hear some construction outside. Well, what do you immediately do without even thinking? You turn on the TV. Um, I think it's important to notice or note that um, 65 decibels is the agreed upon um, level or threshold where you are at risk for a heart attack. And just to put that into perspective, a vacuum cleaner is 70. So, don't clean your house. <laughs> Oops, we repeated this one. Um, so then, of course, uh, noise interference in classrooms. Um, a TED Talk, Julian Treasure actually pointed out that in a classroom designed poorly for sound, even if you're in just the fourth row, um, speech intelligibility is half, 50%. So you can either look at that as a student would have to um, strain themselves twice as hard or you'll get half the information. So clearly there's an issue. And it became very obvious that a school should be, would have the most um, opportunity for this design. Um, but not only that, rather than just looking at the benefits and the cons of sound in general, there's opportunity. So there's navigational, social, musical, and aesthetic opportunities involving sound. So um, a really great example for navigational is the visually impaired. Now, that doesn't apply to everybody, but we still subconsciously get a lot of these cues. Um, so I'm gonna actually sidestep here just to um, in introduce a few concepts of sound um, properties. It's a little technical, but down the road, it's um, relevant to materials and how they interact with sound. Um, so, stepping back, sound, it's the disturbance of molecules in an elastic medium propagating away from the source, and those disturbances heard. Um, so, it's a lot of jargon, but basically, there's a disturbance, and it's heard. So, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, it is not making a sound. Um, so the three characteristics that I want to talk about, um, sound level, frequency, and propagation. The first two are very basic. Um, of course, sound level or magnitude 
is exactly what it sounds like, and this is a visual representation. And then frequency um, to the musician might be the tone, um, also known as pitch, and this is the visual rep representation of that. And then propagation is where it gets complicated. This is how the sound actually spreads and travels. So going back to the whole elastic medium um, propagation, I think this is a good way to represent sound. So if you think about a, um, a crowded subway sub and you get on it, well, the people need to spread out a little bit and then the person next to them might need to shove over a little bit and then the next person maybe a little bit and then even less and less until the person in the way back didn't even know somebody else got on. So that's kind of like how sound um, is distributed. So think of them as individual molecules and you are the sound source. And then a couple, I want to say, phenomena of the way sound um, actually travels are some, here's some rough illustrations of um, a couple of things like reflection, absorption, um, and then speaking of reflection, there's different ways they can actually be reflected. So there's sound focusing. Of course, if you're on a, um, in a concave surface, there's the opposite of that, which is scattering. And then a form of scattering is uh, diffusion. And it's interesting that low frequencies require larger, I want to say, irregularities in the surface for them to be diffused. And then conversely, the higher frequencies require smaller irregularities. So it's an actual physical thing that can change something like sound. And then lastly, diffraction. Um, so you have your sound source. And then those green lines represent the um, optical shadow. So you know your typical shadow. So everything between the, um, so if this is a wall, everything between the green is your optical shadow, uh, and then actually sound bends around that. Um, so higher frequencies bend a little bit, and then lower frequencies bend even further. So these um, are applied down the road um, in this design. So back to our original um, example. So if you think about the visually impaired, and he or she is tapping the stick, so that's not just a haptic response, it's actually in a form of echolocation. So you can think about the delay that the sound makes from a wall is directly related to the distance that the wall is. Um, the intensity or the actual sound level is directly related to the area, so that determines how much sound is actually reflected towards you. And then the frequency content is um, directly related to the material. So whether it's a massive material or if it's um, a rough material, they can actually, we can actually sense that, um, whether it's subconscious or conscious. Um, and then there's social opportunities, of course, thinking about if you go into a uh, hotel lobby and there's a lot of hard surfaces, well, your footsteps echo, and that's a way of the sound announcing your entry, so that's a very public space. Subconsciously, you know that. And then conversely, you have um, a very soft, heavily drapery room, and you walk in there, it's very quiet, muted. You know that it's a more comforting uh, private space, just based on sound. Um, and then musical opportunities, this is an obvious one. So whether the space facilitates the music being played, what kind of music's being played, kind of like how we were talking about before uh, with um, the Peabody Library and the uh, Sydney Opera House. And then aesthetic opportunities, so very similar to uh, visual aesthetics. These ornamentations all have the same implications for sound. Um, light is a wave, sound is a wave, so there's a lot of similarities between the two. There are different types of waves, but we don't need to get into all that. Um, so, upon all this research, one of the struggles or reservations we, me and my committee came across was how do, how do we accurately communicate this design and how do I prove to you that I'm doing what I, am, what I say I'm doing? So we thought, okay, well let's come up with a taxonomy or some kind of language to communicate. 
rather than just saying, you know, loud or high pitch or what have you, I came across descriptions of generally music, uh, the sound. So you have, they're called timbres, um, and you can compare that to uh, colors it's often compared to. So you can start to describe a color. So blue might be uh, like a cool color. Uh, maybe it's rich, maybe it's a little bit dark, but you can't really fully describe it. So that's similar to how a timbre is. But what we did is we started to abstract it. What are the compositions of, say, a warm sound? So a fuller sound that's more depth and then lower to mid frequencies um, is what that would be consisted of. And then I took the program, um, which I actually received from Baltimore City um, K-8 Music School. So it's pretty detailed. But what we did is we plotted, we took each element, programmatic element, and chose one or two of those timbres to define it based on whether there's a certain mood we wanted to evoke or whether it was um, a space for communication, like a, like a classroom, you want it to be more intelligible, you want to avoid resonance in that type of room. So this was, in a way, our Rosetta Stone for um, designing these rooms. So, just to um, kind of elaborate on the timbre. So, if you think about an instrument, there's actually, you hear an instrument and you think it's making one sound. Well, in reality, there's two components to that sound. There's the original sound source, whether it's um, a, a reed, or if it's a vibrating string, or if it's the membrane of a drum. Um, and then there's a, an actually actual enclosure, a body of this instrument, that manipulates the sound. So a cello, for example, the vibrating string obviously is the sound source, and then the enclosure of the cello um, modifies or in a way filters that, um, that sound, creating its timbre. And then similarly a flute, um, which actually has a smaller chamber, um, that makes it so the, um, the cello, since it's a larger enclosure, it's more resonant, so it's easier to make the, um, the sound uh, more blended and smooth versus a, a flute where it's a little bit more staccato and um, the notes are more individual. So the reason I bring this up is that it's not so much of a stretch to consider architecture an extension of the instrument. So if you're playing an instrument indoors, which most of the time you will be, you can consider the instrument the sound source and then the actual enclosure of the space, the, the, act, the body, the, the modifier of the sound. Um, so just to kind of recap all this jargon, um, you know, what's our design goal? It's, why are we doing this? So our own unconsciousness, um, it's not so much that we're unconscious, but I think it's that our attentions are elsewhere and that we tolerate force um, sound. So this is, of course, impairing education, health, behavior, mood, and other things. So what are we gonna do about this? Of course, we're gonna improve the sound quality in our design, um, but we don't wanna just provide a good sounding space for these kids. Um, you know, the old adage, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Well, we want to teach these kids to fish. So we want to have them recognize that it's um, good sound quality. Um, so we're going to increase oral recognition. So how do we do that? Of course, number one, prioritize oral design. Um, number two, though, we came up with a, a three-step process, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but we're going to provide unique and unfamiliar um, experiences. So whether they're contradictory or um, unexpected, uh, this is a quote from uh, a, a book. Basically, even if you're completely unaware of sounds, if you're provided with these spaces, you will become aware. Um, so now I'll orient us um, with the site. So I totally backed up. I thought, where should the school go? I considered the adjusted cohort graduation rates. Um, 
And it's a pretty striking difference between city and suburb, the number of students that actually graduate on time. So I thought, okay, let's go to a city. Went to large mid-Atlantic cities. DC happened to be the lowest at 69%. Looked at the lowest uh, high school school districts, um, which are here. And then because of other uh, considerations, on the right you can see that's where I decided to plant this school and it happened to be in a, in a void within all the other schools. Um, these are middle and uh, elementary schools. Oh, it's a little blurry on the left. Um, so here you can see uh, where the site is. Um, it's pretty close to the uh, convention center and it's a pretty prominent location because there's some surface parking right across the street so it's kind of a peninsula in this big void within, um, within the city, um, immediately east of Mount Vernon Square. And then it's very close to the green and yellow line. So the idea here is that the school should be for everyone and having public transportation or access to that um, allows those who maybe can't have um, transportation to have access. Um, and then here's an aerial, zooming in a little closer, and then of course um, the existing figure ground conditions. There's three little structures there, one of which is abandoned, the other, um, they're, they're pretty derelict buildings. Um, and then here's a transportation map showing the prominent bus stops, the lanes, and the proximity to the metros. And then um, this is a congestion map. So this isn't necessarily traffic, but this is where the congestion happens, so this could perhaps inform where um, pick-up and drop-off happens. Um, so I will redirect your attention to the boards, if you don't mind, um, to talk more specifics about the design. But as I mentioned, um, we considered a three-step process uh, for these students. So kindergarten, through second grade or at the top two levels, which would be the stimulation levels. Um, here, you know, when you're in, at a young age, you learn um, simple rhythms and, and tones like that. So we're gonna provide uh, what we have as a, an oral playground in the center um, glass box at the top. And uh, actually, before I get into those specifics, I'll talk about the overall organization. So as you can see here, the private spaces are flanking the central core, and the majority of these, these actual um, experiences will take place within the center public area. Um, and then the classrooms are within the private spaces. So, um, moving forward again, simulation stimulation um, layers. You have the kindergarten and special education on the sixth floor. And then right below that you have uh, first and second. So again, the younger kids will just be kind of starting out. Maybe they'll play uh, easy instruments, get, get an idea of what they like. Um, and then right when they think that they're comfortable is when they get to the third through fifth grade levels, which is split between, or sorry, third through eighth grade levels, which is split between two levels, which is, uh, we call the reflection level. So there's um, experiences that, again, are contradictory, unfamiliar, um, or unexpected. So as you can see in this friend group here, you have this corridor, which um, is mimicking a, uh, an acoustic shadow that we talked about before. So in a way, it's a continuation of the, the corridors um, within the private spaces. So you're not in an isolated acoustic zone, but going in and out, there will be a pretty extreme acoustic difference. And then also, so this rendering is taken in the music center, which is a series of volumes within a larger space, and those volumes are the, um, the practice rooms, which are lining the top. And rather than going through each one individually, um, each one is supposed to mimic a specific timbre um, based on its materiality, its geometry, its volume. 
Um, I think I have, okay, so I have three of them here. Uh, we have, the one on the left is the anechoic chamber. This is actually a really extreme example. So this is almost 100% sound absorption. So it's, it's an incredibly, um, in a way, disorienting space. And then these other two that I consider the twins, these are, you can see them here on the right. They're actually um, the opposites of each other. So the one in the center, that's, it's a contradiction between your, the visual space and the, the acoustic space. So you go into this glass box within a larger enclosure, and visually you, you know you're in a large space, but then when you play your instrument, it's clearly um, the acoustic arena is smaller. And then conversely, you're in an opaque cube um, that, that would be perforated metal, and visually you're in a smaller uh, cube and then the sound would propagate throughout and the um, delay in the, in the echo would have you recognize that you're in a larger space. Um, and then moving on down to the indulgence level. So this is the, the public level. Um, we figured, you know, if we're going to provide these acoustic spaces, they should engage the community, um, which is something that a school should do anyway. So down here you have amenities that, uh, that would suit um, the public needs as well as, you know, the students on a daily basis. So you have the recital hall, um, the main gathering space uh, for the, you know, before class, after class, waiting for rides. Um, the gym and the cafeteria. So just a few examples of um, this quote indulgence would be down here if you can see the gym. So the seating is in this focused arch so that the spectators and the um, and whoever's playing uh, basketball or whatever sport would have a closer oral connection. And then the recital hall is a very obvious indulgent acoustic experience and it actually has two different tunings. So if you look all the way to the right in the renderings, the one on the top has the, uh, there's strips of curtain that go between these wood, these curved wood um, side panels. And then they roll back up for a more resonant. Uh, they have, these are the right curtains go between, so it's kind of like a basket weaving. Um, and that would lower the reverberation time. So maybe if it's going to be a, like a lecture, that's something that you would want. And then down here, you have a more uh, hard surface and a diffused, you have this irregularity that would diffuse the sound and it would be a, um, a much more, uh, a longer reverberation time. So if it's like a, a very choral tonal sound, song, um, and then a few other just notable um, aspects of the design. You can see here in the cafeteria, which is above the administration, you have these sound focusing panels as well, um, but they're porous, so you get that sound focusing uh, as well as the overall volume of the space, so it's still exciting, it's still resonant. Um, your typical classroom uh, design in, in uh, the section, you can really see the uh, the shape that's kind of mimicking a lecture hall um, to improve speech intelligibility. Um, you can see that in plan as well. Um, and then, lastly, the, the central gathering space, you have this coffered ceiling to uh, provide that oral embellishment, much like the visual one. Um, so, Again, I'm, I'm presenting this school to you, but I want to emphasize that, that it's, it's more about the shift in your um, focus, a shift in your recognition to other senses, specifically your sense of hearing, and this is the kind of design that would um, suit really any building typologies, but especially hospita or hospitals and office, et cetera. So really every building should start to be designed this way and um, in that way, you know, our cities become symphonies.
Um, thank you, and I'll open it up. about the architecture of your building and the way it fits in the urban site, mm -hmm. why you shift the grid, uh, why, uh, I mean the section, I start to clarify a little bit, the interior composition is some rooms which are higher and some are lower and so on, but it seems to me that uh, should be important for you to explain more about the architectural concept mm -hmm. uh, why I don't know the, the acoustic panel are in certain position instead of the other why one ceiling is in wood and one looks in jigboard or something since we want to see how this application of your knowledge about uh, the physics of sound mm -hmm. is applied to the building yeah, so I, I will definitely gladly indulge any questions. So to back up to your first question um, about the shift in the grid, um, that was primarily to angle the, the recital hall on that prominent corner of New York Avenue. And as a lucky result, that made the structural grid of this these regular classrooms kind of work out because of the angular walls, um, which is shifted at 10 degrees. Um, and then in terms of the panels, uh, it kind of goes back to the, the mass, and I, I didn't want to get in two specifics of each thing because this isn't an engineering project. Um, but again, it goes back to the mass. So if it's you know wood, that that's more of a balanced, warm uh, reflection, um, you know, versus a stone. So we have some stone examples up here that would uh, that would reflect the uh, like the higher frequencies versus the lower ones, so certain ones are more amplified. Um, but as you can see, wood is a pretty prominent material because of its acoustic um, properties. Directional microphone. So acoustics is a really uh, wicked problem yeah. for architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of like economics. It's kind of like a dark art. Nobody really knows when things work and why. Uh, I have a colleague on the main campus of Virginia Tech, Michael Ehrman, who is devoted to this topic and just published a book on acoustics for architectural education, which is a fantastic resource. And like choreography and like music, acoustics has its own notation for you to be able to understand how it behaves. Mm -hmm. And my concern is there's a big disconnect between your prelude explaining acoustics and the graphic representation of its behavior. And it's not an easy thing to answer, but I feel like the sort of jittery uh, line drawings are an attempt to symbolize vibration but they're not helping us understand how any of this happens in a given room in the building. Um, you've got lots of little kids, they make their own noise. Um, and so I'm not sure that the building is telling the story of how it actually is behaving. I would expect to see far more sections. Uh, sections of rooms at much larger scale where you attempted the way we diagram light reflection the angle of incidence and the dispersal and all of those things that you diagrammed there so that we could look at this and believe that, ah yes, if you use a coffered ceiling, you're going to get, sound gets trapped up there and it bangs around against itself and then it's quieted down below. So there's a real interesting challenge of how to actually get that, actually get your drawings to make noise. Your drawings are not making noise and so then we're evaluating them purely visually again. 
which takes us back to your critique. And then there's some other problems with that. I'd be careful with the color coding. I'm looking at that color coding and trying to sort of match it up with the colors over here. But there's not a match, right? So there's a code here that means something mm -hmm. to you. <laughs> but, but when something is green, when it's gray, when it's pink, I looked over there to see if that would tell me, um, but it doesn't. And so that's noise instead of music, so I'd be careful about that. Um, it's an interesting site, uh, but I feel like once you told us about the site, the site ceased to be important. So there is an acoustic context to this site. Right. In fact, New York Avenue sounds different from 6th Street, which sounds different from K Street. And the opportunity to do an aural site analysis, I think, would be really fascinating. I don't know if you intend it, or if, again, it's a side effect of how you drew it. You drew all the plans as if they're uh, in the basement. That is, they're all surrounded by gray. So when I look at level B1, it has the same surroundings as level 6. And whether that's a commentary on your desire to acoustically isolate this building from the city, that sort of comes across. But then I look at the building you've got and the rendering, and I wonder how, how is that glass behaving when a bus goes by? What are the strategies for slightly inclining the exterior glass so you bounce sound back down? And should you do that? Then are you actually making the pedestrians more miserable on K Street? Um, then there's just the opportunities to think about syncopation and rhythm and polyrhythms in how you develop the fenestration, how you develop the language of the building. So it's a great, rich topic. Um, and I feel like you, you just sort of turned the radio dial or the volume. Um, but there's a lot, I sort of would, I mean, I, full confession, I'm an amateur musician myself, and so I'm really intrigued with this project, and I know what it sounds like when you play in an awful space. Um, so, and I also know how exciting it is to walk past a building in the city where you hear people practicing. And so that urban experience of what you're offering the city, orally, I think is something you want to think a little bit more about, mm -hmm. and how to represent that. Yeah, actually, um, I'll address a few of those things. You said quite a lot, so I want to at least try to remember most. Um, I think you're absolutely right between the colors. Uh, I did have an intention behind this one, and these were early on diagrams. I, I guess my justification was that there are different tones, so maybe they wouldn't be confused, but I, I totally agree that... Um, right. Um, uh, I do want to talk about urban context for a second, um, because that's something that I, I did not talk about a lot, and that was in a way intentional, but there were a few things that I, I failed to mention. So this is a building designed from the inside out, and but that doesn't, that, I don't want to say that I'm ignoring the urban content. So of course you have the, the recital hall being celebrated on this prominent corner, but also you have that glass, um, which will really you know, illuminate maybe at night. Uh, I was I was thinking um, about the external materials. We have travertine and limestone. I know it's, it's nice materials, but um, uh, so there's more stone materials that would be reflective to, to keep that um, the urban noise away. And then I think your comment about the New York Avenue, you know, bus traffic. That was something I failed to mention. So these uh, corner rooms, these are gonna, I call them uh, the scene rooms because it's double pane glass, uh, which you can kind of see at the scale. I think, you know, large scale things uh, is uh, an apt thing to say. Um, but the idea here is that you would see all these cars going by. Maybe there's an ambulance, but you wouldn't hear them to further emphasize that contradiction. So I'd imagine maybe reading um, time happens in there, or maybe it's uh, some kind of media center. Um, so, yeah, that was the intention there. And I th there was one other thing I wanted to say, but it, it's escaping me now. Oh, I think, sorry, just the last thing I was going to say is, uh, when you said that I kind of like scratched the surface, that's, that's the thing about um, this building, is that there's just so much opportunity to take this any which way, and it's a larger building, so 
you know, I could just keep going and keep going, and I, I really intend to, so I thank you for that comment. Um, so I appreciate the explanation in the beginning, I think I definitely le learned more about um, the issues of, of sound and, and acoustics, but I'm focused on your perspectives and trying to understand, like you said, you want this building to be kind of a teaching tool, not, not just create spaces that sound good, but that people are aware that you really promoted that, tried hard to solve that. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly the perspective on the Music Center, I guess I want to see both in these perspectives and the plans, like to let the architecture really celebrate this and solve it. Um, and um, right now, a lot of the elements that you talked about don't feel super integrated into the architecture. They feel almost post-applied or okay. just after the fact and stuck on the wall. Um, and it oddly actually makes me think of like work decades ago that really began to promote issues of sustainability and they kind of fell victim to that too stick something on the yeah. building and check some boxes and say I'm promoting sustainability, but mm -hmm. we've come a long way in that mm -hmm. um, conversation, I think. And all of these elements can be really integrated in the architecture and be beautiful in and of themselves and not bought products. Yeah. And so I, I wish you could develop that mm -hmm. language a little bit more and then each space can start to distinguish itself, be sculpted more, feel different from the next one. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think you're your building becomes more of a teaching tool yeah. in that way. Um, and um, I guess urbanistically, when I looked at that perspective on the right-hand side, to me, you, you said it, I think it's a building designed from the inside out. Um, I know that you wanted this theater to kind of gesture towards the corner, and, and perhaps in plan it does, but it, that feels a little bit like a forgotten volume. You know, I, I wish that was something more to get excited about. Uh, I worry people walking on the sidewalk just have a blank wall next to them. You know, maybe that could have been actual circulation space where you see people gathering and entering the theater. Um, but I don't. I don't. It does does feel a little bit like it, it's a victim of kind of designing inside out. So I think those two comments, those overarching comments that you made, are really related. How you kind of mentioned maybe this, for example, how it's like tacked on. So I think that's a question of attitude. So you know, you could integrate it more in the architecture, which I think is very interesting, or if it is sticking out, if it does kind of look tacked on, so to speak, then in a way it's, it's, it's more of a, um, it's more noticeable for these kids who might not be architecturally literate. Um, and similarly, that was the, the motives behind the, the, I guess, sore thumb of, a, of the recital hall, so that was to be celebrated, and not only aesthetically, but um, Structurally, which I didn't talk about, but it is an isolated structure to improve the or negate the sound in our appearance. Yeah, just to follow on the the last comment, mm -hmm. uh, I would be very interested to see more from my point of view as an architect about how you make it. I think that your drawings are really focusing on the what it looks like to perform in this way. Mm -hmm. But what I'm interested in is how how you make it so that it performs in that way. And that's why, I, you know, harkening back to another comment, I'd love to see bigger sections mm -hmm. that show what I think are these two different ways of uh, making spaces acoustically performative. One is the form of the space, and the other is the that kind of separation between the inner uh, envelope and the structural um, uh, right. elements. And so uh, rather than a section that uh, you know essentially blanks out all of what's happening in there, I'd be really interested to see you know, how the building is made and how, uh, how then the acoustic qualities are made either by that shaping or by you know, judicious additions of other materials and how they're connected and so forth. I think that's the next step for you. Clearly, this is your passion. And so I think um, you know, further description of how you make it is, is that next architectural step. Actually, Maddie, I have a new question. Could you mind elaborating on how, you, what do you mean by how you make it? Do you mean actual the actual sounds themselves relating to oh, the no, space? No, no, I mean, I mean, translating this into an architectural language, 
where you are making spaces that need to, you know, perform uh, structurally. So what's the structure look like? What's the continuity through the levels of the building? Because the structure is going to be that continuity. And then, uh, I, what is it about the forms of the spaces that are uh, creating the acoustic performance. Those right. are the diagrams that Susan was talking mm -hmm. about. So how's the sound moving? And then in the cases where it's not the form of the space itself, but it's um, it, it's a kind of an inner envelope, well, that creates the form of the space. How do you make that inner envelope? What are the elements? Mm -hmm. How are they connected back to the structure? And, you know, just all of the, the detail, what's it made of, right? And, uh, you know, you talk about this as an instrument of architecture, and so I'm, I'm very interested in how this instrument is made. You know, if it's a violin, how'd you make that violin? Uh, in this case, it's a building, so how'd you make that building? You know, I think, I think you can teach architects to translate between this, this keen, um, understanding of the physics of sound and that understanding of the materials and methods of architecture how do you how do you bring it together so that i think you know would be the next step for you yeah i think um that's a good point about teaching not only students about acoustics but architects too you know design thinking um i think a lot of this comes down to you know graphic representation which you kind of explicitly alluded to um, however, a structural grid was something that was kept in mind the majority of this. It's, I think, something that I should just have graphically represented. Because, as you can see, you have this lighter section that carries throughout, and then <coughs> this grid um, is something that's pretty repetitive throughout as well. Um, so, I think maybe some type of structural axon would have helped that. And then, similarly, um, about the you know the forms and the volumes, I think that's something that could be carried out more in the maybe in the usable the the residual spaces. I want to say you know of course the classrooms were sculpted a certain way. Uh, I think it's most evident in the practice rooms though because we do have a spectrum of of forms, volumes, materials which were all specifically chosen. Which of course I didn't elaborate on each, but each one has. Um, you know, a specific intent behind it. So the idea was that, you know, if this is a light, you know, cool sounding space, do you, do you pair that, it's kind of like wine pairing, do you pair that with a light, cool sounding instrument? Or do you balance that out, maybe you play a warmer, heavier sounding instrument, you know? Oh, sure. I think what, what I'd ask you for is, for all of these intriguing elements to be explained within the community of the building. And so you've got a big section there. <laughs> if you could quadruple the size of it, and really point out to us. Here's how I'm making that light cool space. And when I, when I talk about structure, I'm not talking about column grid only. Uh, I'm seeing a number of different types of structure in the renderings. And I want to know how they combine in a building. Okay. You know, for for example, the um, uh, the grid ceiling there. Um, you know, I know what it looks like um, when uh, Louis Kahn uh, makes that kind of a ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I'm wondering, how does that relate to the other spaces in the building? Mm -hmm. uh, I I want to understand this as a unity. So you have um, uh, a variety of experiences, but how do they come together yeah. into an architecture, a, a unified architecture? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you how do you make one out of many? Because I think that, that that's something that you must do as an architect when right. you're making a building. I just want to add to that. But I think what Matt is also saying is that it comes down to materials, assemblies, systems, and structure. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, some of that may still be stuff that you're still processing, integrating into the, in, in your mind and how this stuff is done. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, come back and after how many hours, 3,500 hours, 3,700 hours of uh, AXP, I should know this since I'm the, the, the coordinator. 
Uh, come back after that period of time just before you do the ARE, mm -hmm. and, and you'll be you'll be able to answer that question with a higher level of resolution. But I think that, you know, I, I think we we recollect a time when, and this is a kind of beginning of a segue, we recollect a time when thesis projects did this naturally. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, and this is not a critique of you, it just seems to me as a kind of arc of theses and an arc of architectural education that we've stepped back a little bit from that kind of thing and more towards something that's more representational and pictorial. And you had the microphone, sir. Thank you. So, uh, Josh, uh, it's a very interesting topic, and I'm trying to find a way to judge um, kind of what you've done on the terms that you've set forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how can we hear it? <laughs> yeah, um, that's obviously impossible, but it's, it's kind of to say um, we're probably kind of finding a hard time trying to kind of judge the solutions uh, against your intent. And I think that goes to just the challenge of what you set out of tackling a, uh, a technology that, you, that you're feeling is under, uh, kind of represent, underrepresented in architects' minds. It's probably one of multiple technologies in a building that need to get uh, integrated, whether that's sustainability, whether that's structure, whether that's, um, you know, acoustics is certainly a, a, an important one. I've uh, been fortunate to work on many um, kind of recital halls and theaters uh, in my career, and so I've seen this kind of dance between you know what, what we do is we hire a leading uh, in one of the country's uh, leading acousticians, and we work very uh, closely together uh, with multiple workshops in order to kind of share ideas back and forth. And it's an interesting back and forth that uh, usually pits aesthetic issues. For some reason, things that sound good actually don't look good. Yeah. Um, and you're constantly having to kind of dance back and forth in order to, um, in order to kind of find a, a, a mutual point of, um, of agreement. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, if that's helpful, you know, the way, the, the, there's an awful lot of knowledge that you have kind of gone and researched mm -hmm. that's probably impossible to sort of judge whether what you've done kind of works or doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, have you, had you re reached out to any acousticians as part of the, the research and interviewed them? As to yeah, um, actually ironically, somebody at the Peabody Institute I, I spoke with pretty closely. Um, but I will, I will challenge that, that you should be careful with the word technology. So this is, um, I, I wanted to, the intent was that it was more experiential, more abstract and, and subjective. Um, and the way that I would communicate that is by coming up with this taxonomy, which I will agree, I think I did myself a disservice by the way I spoke about it. Um, even the example, you know, the entry lobby, um, the intent behind that was uh, a very resonant, light sounding space. So a larger glass space, even coming in, you, you get this, so oftentimes you go into this um, moment of compression between inside and outside. Well, similarly, that's how the entry was designed, that it would be an acoustic compression. You know, you go from the, the busy outside, and then this moment of silence, and then this exciting, maybe even a little bit strident entry, so it's very public. So I think maybe that's something that should be worked on. Is well, and I didn't mean what I said is really any, any uh, critique yet of the forms and kind of designs you made, just an observation that I think that the terms of exploration acoustically uh, have to be kind of judged separately from some of the aesthetic uh, decisions that you've made that may or may, may not be central to the, 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 the thesis. Mm -hmm. You know, you've done some things in terms of the facade and, and objectifying the recital hall, um, quite a bit different than the rest of the building around it, and that's something we could, we could kind of talk about at length. Um, and so those formal moves may or may not be related to the acoustical ones. Um, and I just I think that that's an interesting problem that you've, you've put to yourself through, the, uh, through this, the, the thesis. And I think understanding just how you would judge acoustics and how you would judge success in this is, uh, is difficult. I, I will say, you know, in terms of the, the forms that you've made, um, because I, I actually believe that you know, the Peabody Museum is a great example of a space that probably sounds better 
because it looks better. And there actually is, um, and there's, there's many of uh, the acquisitions I've worked in that would agree that a space that looks better somehow feels better. You know, draping it in wood, and it's important. Um, but you've, that, that window that you have kind of out to the street, bringing natural light, it certainly is possible to bring you know, a lot of light. You could have expanded on that and made that even more powerful. But the, the bus traffic and the, you know, the, the sense of what you've done has an important um, uh, issue that needed to be solved in terms of the acoustical environment that created. That, that move of having the, the stage you know, backlit by a view out to the street, just cars and headlights. And so there's a performance aspect to that, but there's also an acoustic aspect and you know, a need for you know, some pretty uh, expensive detailing in order to pull that off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually that was an intent as well, um, being a backdrop, an acoustic backdrop, because oftentimes lower frequencies dominate the higher ones because it's more energy. So if you have two or three inch glass, um, that'll kind of amplify those lower frequencies. Um, and it is a double layer, so you have the one, you know, preventing the external noise, the environmental noise, um, as well as the reflective surface for the um, performance. But that, of course, doesn't justify every comment you made. But. Very quickly, Josh. You know, you probably would have been helped in the beginning if you had stated that my thesis is to test the acoustical performance of a high of a, of a school on an urban site in Washington, D.C., and then moved into the research. Because it took me a long time to figure out exactly what the project was and precisely. Um, I'm stuck because I can't evaluate the performance side of the research. So I look at the plans, and the plans are naive. You don't have any fire stairs. You can't get out of the auditorium. The fire stairs that you do have, the door swings are wrong, and the fire stairs are too small. Where are the bathrooms? So at the level of architecture, I'm finding these are sort of like bubble diagrams without a big idea. I understand the rotation, but you might have chosen the other rotation of the other grid, or not, but some explanation. I know you wanted to to deform the, you didn't want a, a regular rectangular classroom. But there's a whole issue of the elegant plan elegance and movement and circulation. You open the front door, but where do you go in that plan? It looks like you're in a triangular space with no way out. So there's graphic issues that really are tripping you up. And part of the research, and the reason I'm sounding like a tire kicker is Part of the research is into how you actually draw an auditorium. What are all the pieces of it? The vestibules, the lifts, the backstage stuff. There's no backstage. You're in trouble with this if, if the thesis depends on it solving the school. And, you're, and because you can't demonstrate the performance side of the, the uh, acoustical agenda, which you've thoroughly investigated, although well, we haven't explained your little models, which is fun. Um, I'm stuck. I feel, I feel slightly, I mean, I, I wish I could engage with you more about it, but it's hard. The images are fine, in, insofar as they're warm, and one imagines that they'd be nice to be in. But I can't relate them to the plans in the section, so that it makes it difficult. I think you're, I think you're fooling yourself a little bit about trying what problem you're trying to solve. But I'm not sure because I'm not sure in the way you stated the thesis that you fully understood what it was you're trying to do. But again, it's late in the day and. And I, I shouldn't focus on fire stairs, but it seems odd that you can't get out of your auditorium. There, there are two fire stairs? Yeah, um, that's not, but when you go down the stairs, you get to the bottom, you're below grade. You've got to get out of, the fire code demands you get out of the bottom of that thing. Yeah, there's this, this door here, and um, there's, there's actually a level right below this for the, the back of house operations, and that is immediately adjacent to this fire stair. I don't believe it. I'm sorry. I mean, I believe you think it's there, but I don't believe it works. 
Josh, um, do I have a few minutes? Um, I know that um, you started out by uh, being very intrigued with uh, sound, and um, but your thesis says enhancing education through sonic sensitivity. So you used a school, you used a learning environment to to test these these. Uh, Theories. Um, in, unfortunately, um, I think you didn't pay much attention to the education part of it, because when you really look at it, the way you you organize this this building, there are reasons why things are what they are. You are very enamored with the physics of sound. Those are unbendable, right? I mean, sound propagates in, in always the same way, and it depends on the pressure, depends on the on the surfaces it's, it, it's hitting, it's going to change, it's going to do what it needs to, uh, to do. Architecture has some rules as well. There are ways that we need to design classrooms for a reason. For There are spaces that need to happen for collaboration. There's a reason why uh, kindergartners need to be on the first floor. There's a reason why if you're going to put uh, 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 little kids in any other space besides the first floor, you need to start thinking about the volume of children going up an elevator because their little legs cannot go up steps. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of things, and now that you know that, and if you had done that kind of research, you could have justified putting that auditorium perhaps on the upper floor, and that could have become an object. Also, you're saying, oh, I'm designing from the inside out. That's great, but there are forces in, in here. You're not in space. You're in the city. There's buildings around you, there's elements that you could have drawn from that would help on your elevation. There's all kinds of um, analogies that you could have brought from sound to help you syncopate your elevation like it was mentioned earlier. Um, besides the graphic issues going from you know, 1 to 500 to 1 eighth scale, there's not a interim scale there. Um, I see the exploration here for um, public space versus private space, and I, I don't see, I, I, I'm wondering if you're just looking for form more than you're actually looking for substance. So, um, when I look at spaces like this, this is one of the worst spaces for sound you can imagine. And you put it in a gym, I mean, I, like... It's late. Um, I, mean, I don't need to keep going, but... Uh, I hope when you go into private practice, into practice because this is your thesis and you you pay attention to these things because they exist for a reason. Thanks. Josh, did you get the program from home somewhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, it, it wasn't DC. I got it um, from uh, Baltimore. Oh, really? Yeah, that's I, I had access to that. It was a real program. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Bring our conversation to a close. I think a lot of a lot of these issues are things that, that Josh has been wrestling with. Uh, I think that the distinction between was he designing a school or was he designing this acoustic architectural experience that happened to manifest the school was something he tackled early on. Uh, Josh started with the premise that it was absolutely going to be a music school, and at a certain point he said, "Well, okay, does it does it have to be?" Are there other ways we really want to get at a thesis that is about an idea about acoustic spaces or acoustic awareness? Does it have to be music school? What else could it be? And you explored a lot of different things. I think there's been a lot of exploration this year. I think a few things today have actually tilted things uh, towards the negative. I think representation just doesn't communicate some of the things that you have considered. That there are a lot of open ended issues relative to resolving a school, but that I think that whoever made the comment that really stating the thesis up front might have uh, changed that. I think there's also a tremendous amount of your energy and thinking that have gone into these individual practice rooms, but even having them without a kind of uh, title to identify what they are and what they're doing or a discussion about them. But there's been a tremendous amount of work. I mean, here, it was not just a formal study, but it was a programmatic study. I think it was a smart idea to take the, the program and things that you found from the school, because that really wasn't part of your thesis. So you, you adapted, you took the existing program from a Baltimore, uh, it's Baltimore Public School. So 
I think you, you've explored a tremendous amount, and right from the beginning, this has been a challenge. Is how are you going to be able to prove out the kind of acoustic things that, to me, are nested in the kinds of sound experiences you have there. And another piece that has gotten underplayed today, just in your in your verbal presentation, were the connection. So the, this, what you're now calling stimulation, was really just an awareness, right? Trying to give student, young young students an awareness of different kinds of acoustic experiences, and then. Perplexion, or it was perplexing me because you're just talking about challenging or juxtaposing. So I can see an ambulance outside, but I can't hear it. Or I can hear the street noise, but I can't see it. Right? To disconnect our visual and our oral world. And then to indulge it. Once uh, the students have been made aware and they've been uh, juxtaposed against differences of their visual world and their visual awareness versus the acoustic awareness. But unfortunately, that, that's not the conversation we were able to have today. But I do think the body of work that you done and the rigor with which you've pursued much of those acoustic things. There was a point in time where you talked about learning acoustic modeling software so that we could actually listen to the different rooms. It would have been fantastic, but it was a strategic decision early on that didn't realize that there were, there were other agendas, but we always talked about the double-edged sword of how would we prove that these things were going to sound the way they are. There's much, again, much more information up in there. But I, I want to Thank you, Josh, for taking me along with this ride uh, this year and really getting to understand you know, how you were trying to answer a bigger question with the architectural education that you'd attain is could this sound actually affect and impact people's lives? Still a lot of, a lot of issues on the table, but uh, you've, you've wrestled with a lot and I think you've actually achieved a lot. So thank you very much.